Hello and welcome everyone to today's uh, Kahoot based radiology quiz. So uh, as I had mentioned in my uh, message that I sent out, uh, make sure uh, that if you have like if you have two screens, that would be great. Uh, what you have to do is log into this web address that is K A H O O T that is Kahoot.it and enter the game pin as 339-4775. And I'd request everyone uh, to use their real name uh, the, because the top three uh, contestants uh, have prizes. So there's no way for me to identify uh, if you use a pseudonym. You're free to use a pseudonym, but that'll make uh, it difficult if you win. So make sure uh, that you use a name that I can identify you with. Uh, sorry for the delay. I was just uh, prepping everything up and we'll wait for uh, around uh, three minutes for people to join in because uh, I can understand that it takes time uh, getting used to the system. So I'll just check. Uh... So Kate, uh, uh, yeah, you have to log in to this web ID, kahoot.it and uh, submit your answers there. So the questions will appear on your YouTube uh, video screen and uh, on your mobile screen or wherever you have logged into this web address, kahoot.it, you'll get four large options. Uh, that'll be A, B, C, D. That corresponds to the options that will show up on your screen. So you can uh, select the correct option. I'm waiting uh, for everyone to join in because uh, if you join in late and if you miss a few questions, you may be behind and I don't want anyone to lose on so we'll start exactly at uh, 10 40 if that is okay with everyone so the top three winners have prizes so make sure that you uh, attempt the quiz carefully and as you would attempt uh, a real life exam. For those who are finding it difficult to use the Kahoot address, you can always attempt your answers in the YouTube chat. I'll have a, uh, I'll be keeping a lookout on that as well. And in the interim, I will ask a few questions pertinent to the case, and you can attempt that in the uh, YouTube chat section. Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, for those who are new, my name is Amar Rodare. I'm a, a radiologist currently doing a fellowship at McMaster University, Canada. I'll be your quiz master today. Uh, so Kahoot uh, is uh, basically was started uh, for primary uh, uh, children, uh, for primary education. Uh, it's a quiz based uh, uh, platform. Uh, and I've been trying to use it for uh, radiology education. And so far I've uh, heard very, like, I've got good responses from my residents uh, at McMaster and even from the previous quiz that we conducted. Uh, the goal of this quiz is to uh, discuss a few important radiological findings. And apart from that, that'll also, I'll try to give you a few tips for uh, how to attempt MCQs. And uh, I'll try to, uh, I've made these uh, questions in such a way that, uh, uh, the common MCQ issues that all of us face. Uh, I'm sure all of you uh, at some point are going to give an MCQ based radiology exam. Uh, uh, so, that, so that can be the FRCR exam, uh, your radiology boards or uh, EDIR exam. So I've tried to uh, inculcate uh, a few tips for that as well. So how it works, we, I have 20 questions. Uh, the faster you answer a particular question, the more points you get. So for example, the first five questions uh, or the first few questions are simple questions. 
uh, if you answer them, say, in the, within the first 10 seconds, you'll get more points. Uh, whereas if you take some time, uh, you'll uh, get lesser points. Uh, but at the same time, if you go wrong, you get zero points. The first few questions are easy and straightforward. Uh, and as the quiz progresses, I've tried to make uh, the questions slightly more complex and have improved, uh, increased the difficulty level. Uh, and the last five questions uh, are really tough ones. And uh, for those, I'm going to give you double points. So for example, if you're not doing so well in the starting portion of the quiz, uh, make sure that you wait till the end because the last few questions uh, have double points. So uh, you may end up winning the quiz despite uh, not doing so well in the initial portion. So uh, those are basic instructions. Uh, each question uh, has 30 seconds to begin with. If the question is slightly complex, and especially the last few questions, I've given one minute uh, so that you get enough time uh, for, uh, for those complex questions. Uh, so that was uh, in brief about the quiz and how it will work. We have around 60 people who have logged in to the Kahoot platform, and the top three winners are going to get a book uh, called Search Pattern, A Systematic Di Approach to Diagnostic Imaging. Uh, so that's the book. Uh, the first three winners are going to get uh, this book. So this book uh, gives an approach uh, to any uh, imaging, uh, uh, say, study that you're looking. So for example, if you're looking at uh, an MRI knee, so what search pattern uh, you should approach, uh, approach that with. So I would like to thank uh, Dr. Long Tu, who has sent me this book, and uh, he's going to uh, sponsor the prizes for today's quiz. So without wasting any further time, uh, I will start the quiz. And if you have any questions, uh, you can uh, type in the chat and I'll try to address those. If there are any issues with my audio or video, you can let me uh, know and I can try to sort it out. So let's begin the quiz. So we have 60 contestants and I'm sure more people will join in. So welcome to Radio Gyan's Kahoot radiology quiz. So this is your first question. The first two questions are trial questions. So these do not have any points for you to get used to the system. Uh, I have made these trial questions. Just let me put me here. So I'm trying to position myself at a location where I won't hide any important information. So the question here is what is this investigation called? Is it a CAT scan? Is it an MRI scan? I don't have any idea about this what this study is or is this a CT scan? Okay, so most of you have got it right. So that was a CAT scan. That was just a trial question. For those who are joining in late, uh, there is the, the details and the pin is available in the right lower corner. So the address is kahoot.it. Uh, so if uh, somebody can put in the link uh, and uh, uh, mention the pin uh, that would be great so excellent so thanks Minu for putting uh, the pin in the chat section let's move on to the next question so that is the next question so after every question you'll get the leaderboard so top five contestants uh, moving on to the second question so <laughs> you're reporting in your reporting room and uh, you get a study that you have no idea about say maybe something like a CT myelogram, you've never reported that. What would you do? Sneakily take out your name of the study and move to the next study before anyone notices that you picked it up. Advise clinical correlation. Suggest a short-term follow-up. A short-term can be anything. You just put the ball in the clinician's court or all of the bow. Let's get big. this thing started. Excellent. So all of the bow is the correct answer. And uh, let's get thing, get let's get this thing started. So the questions that follow uh, will have points. These were the trial questions. Hopefully you are uh, uh, well adjusted to the format and understood how this works. Let's. So a few people still are asking for the pin. Uh, let me try to see if I can put in. Okay, so if somebody can share the pin in the chat section, that would be great. Uh, the pin is displayed on the screen as well, so you can check that as well. So, so to, this is our first question, the first actual question. So in this patient with right upper quadrant pain, what is your diagnosis? Is it acute calculus cholecystitis? Is it acute cholangitis? Is it acute hepatitis or is it acute cholecystitis? So 
So what we see here is the gallbladder is inflamed. Uh, it shows significant uh, enhancement and there is pericholecystic fluid. And we also see a few calculi uh, in the neck region. So this was a straightforward case of acute cholecystitis. So most of you have got this one correct. So 56 of you, you have got it correct. Let's move on to the next question. So young male with right lower quadrant pain, what would be the most likely diagnosis? So this is again an ultrasound image, a transverse ultrasound image in the right lower quadrant. What would be the diagnosis for this patient? Would it be acute appendicitis, acute epiploic appendagitis, acute diverticulitis or acute salpingitis? So the important thing to in these MCQ based questions is uh, always read all options correctly because a couple of options may be worded very closely. So like for example, in the previous question, I had called it, there was an option called acute acalculus cholecystitis. So if you're in a hurry trying to solve this, you may mark those by mistake. So make sure that you read all options and uh, excellent, all of you have got it right. So we see the typical description that we talk about incubulated uh, tubular dilated structure uh, in the right lower quadrant with adjacent echogenic fat and it's like it looks blind ending i know it's difficult on a single image but trust me that it was a uh, blind ending so this was a case of acute appendicitis okay so let's move on to the next question so this is how the quiz will sh the the leaderboard will show up so probably uh, these people answered both questions right and they answered fairly quickly that's why they are on top of the list so let's uh, so the question here is abdominal pain and diarrhea so what radiological sign are uh, we seeing in this uh, radiograph is it a thumb printing is it fingerprinting is it a sentinel loop sign or colon cutoff sign so we see this prominent transverse colon so 60 of you have got it right let me switch on my annotations so so you see this prominent uh, loop of colon here and the the wall of the colon has this typical appearance uh, which resembles thumbprint. So if you see these uh, uh, markings, this gives rise to what is known as thumbprinting of the colon. This patient has is had ischemic colitis. So there's a wide differential for colonic thickening causing thumbprinting and uh, this patient ended up having uh, ischemic colitis. So thumbprinting is the sign that I was looking for. Uh, the other signs, we can go over them as well. So the other signs were uh, fingerprinting, I like that's I, that's a made up sign uh, unless there is one actually. Sentinel loop sign and colon cutoff sign are seen in acute pancreatitis when because of the uh, the pancreatic fluid uh, and inflammatory changes, you can see a single prominent loop of colon. So moving on to so what automobile manufacturer would you associate this radiological sign with? So we have MR images. Uh, uh, of the sacrum and for those who have not had their MRI uh, rotations I can walk over the findings so what we see here is uh, these vertically oriented T1 hypo intense lines and there's probably another line which goes horizontally across the sacrum Okay, so we have a request to reduce the background volume and I can do that. So let's get the background volume down. Thank you uh, for that suggestion. SU7FT9, that's an interesting name. So all of you have got it right. So this uh, is the Honda sign seen in sacral insufficiency fractures. So sacral insufficiency fractures commonly are uh, oriented in this vertical direction. Uh, and that is because how the trabeculae are oriented. Uh, so that's the common uh, uh, insufficiency fracture pattern. And when there is a horizontal fracture that runs through the uh, mid portion of the sacrum, that gives rise to this typical H uh, sign. Uh, so it resembles uh, the logo for Honda. And that's why this is known as uh, the Honda sign. So sacral insufficiency fractures. So remember, uh, people use the term stress fractures and uh, insufficiency fractures interchangeably 
you can uh, definitely use that but the correct terminal i'll explain you the correct terminology so whenever there, there is a disproportionate force versus bone strength and there is a fracture you would call them stress fractures now if the bone is normal and there is excessive stress that is known as a fatigue fracture so just think of an athlete who has been running he's fatigued so he will be but his bones are good because he's an athlete uh, in those patients if you get a stress fracture that would be a fatigue fracture on the other hand if you have fractures uh, with normal force uh, with weak bone that would be those would be insufficiency fractures so sacrum is a common location for insufficiency fractures another common location is pelvic uh, the pelvic bones an important point to remember about these fractures the sacral insufficiency fractures is that they can be associated very commonly with uh, fractures of the pubic rami so uh, in most cases if you do say a radiograph or an mri of the pelvis you're going to cover the pubic symphysis also so make sure that you comment uh, on pubic rami fractures also if they're present so that was that case so i think this is question number five the actual question so this is maybe a slightly tough one i'll give you a guys a clue the question is what could be the profession of this patient I will point to the findings in this case. So this is the finding. So the, su the superficial intrapatellar bursa is inflamed. So what would be the cause of superficial intrapatellar bursitis? So the correct answer is uh, clergy clergyman. So housemaid, uh, housemaid's knee is prepatellar bursitis. Clergyman knee is uh, infrapatellar, super, superficial infrapatellar bursitis. Carpenter's knee is same as uh, prepatellar bursitis. And minor's knee is seen in osteoarthritis. I'll show the image once again. So if you get prepatellar bursitis, that would be uh, prepatellar bursitis. So inflammation in this region, that would be housemaid's knee. This is uh, clergyman's knee. This is also known as carpenter's knee and minors knee so they've done a study and find out that minors are more prone to osteoarthritis so that's why they call it minors knee so these are professions around the knee joint uh, so for those who are watching on youtube there's like a, a companion question uh, what muscle uh, around the hip and knee is known as the tailor's muscle so you can attempt that in the chat section and i'll move on to the next case need to get rid of this sorry about that let's move on to the next question so at the end of five questions ayush is at the top of the list and krishnan and sandra are not far behind and remember the last five questions have double the points so uh, make sure that if you are not uh, in the competition to begin like in the like in the initial phases the last questions you can definitely catch up Okay, so which of the following is not true regarding the following pathology? So these questions can be tough, uh, the double negative uh, ones. So make sure that you read them really carefully uh, before attempting your answer in the exam. Ideally, they should not be giving these questions, but uh, that's how it has been. So you will get uh, these questions in your exam. So make sure you read the question and all the options really carefully. So the question here uh, is, and I'm sure most of you have got the diagnosis so far. So what we see here uh, is that the kidneys are fused in the midline. Uh, uh, so this is a case of horseshoe kidney. Typically a benign diagnosis, you don't need to do a lot about it, but there are a few associations that uh, you need to be aware of. So that's, how, uh, that's what this question is based on. So, excellent. So for the previous question, uh, the Taylor muscle, so that's sartorius, and all of you have got it right. Uh, so someone has mentioned that I, uh, you guys cannot see my pointer. Uh, do you guys see my pointer? Uh, please let me know in the comments if you see my pointer. Uh, 
so 14 have you got uh, 14 of you have uh, said option a uh, increased risk of will tumor that's false so that is actually correct so will uh, horseshoe kidney is associated uh, with a ton of uh, other findings so they can be associated with uh, malignancies which includes wilms tumors they are associated with number of chromosomal abnormalities which includes downs turners uh, and i think even edwards so they are definitely associated with chromosomal abnormalities uh, the other option was increased risk of renal calculi. So yeah, they are definitely at increased risk of calculi and hydronephrosis. The last option uh, was ascent restric uh, restricted by SMA. The, so the so pelvic uh, the kidneys uh, in the fetus are formed in the pelvis and then they ascend superiorly. Uh, normal kidneys do not have a connection, so they can ascend smoothly to their uh, to the renal fossa below the adrenal glands. But in cases of uh, horseshoe kidney, they cannot ascend superiorly, not because of the SMA, but because of the IMA. So the IMA uh, restricts the ascent of horseshoe kidneys. And often you can see uh, the artery uh, uh, traversing the hilum, like moving over the hilum of the uh, fused horseshoe kidney. So that was uh, the correct option for that one. Okay, so moving on to the next question. So what is the most important diagnosis for this supine radiograph? I know it can be difficult to pick up subtle findings, but there is a very obvious finding which will help you diagnose this. Okay, so unfortunately my uh, annotations are not showing up, which is kind of a bummer. Uh, neither is my mo uh, mouse showing up, so maybe I can uh, correct it in the next time. I did try to use an annotation software, but for some reason that's not working. So maybe next time. So uh, 59 of you have got it correct. Uh, so what we see here uh, in this patient, uh, so this is an ICU patient. You can see multiple lines and tubes. So these, these radiographs can be really difficult to report. Uh, so, so what I do, uh, what I follow is uh, I start usually with describing all these lines and tubes and then move on to uh, the chest and other findings. So uh, the important finding in this case is that the right uh, pleural angle, if you see, that's uh, way more prominent than the left. So that you can barely see the left uh, costophrenic angle. Uh, and it appears more lucent than the right for sure. And if you look carefully, uh, I know it can be difficult on smaller screens, but there is definitely uh, a pneumothorax, which is very uh, evident here. And the sign that I wanted to highlight in this case was the deep sulcus sign uh, in cases of, in, on a supine radiograph. So on, on, on PA radiographs, uh, commonly the air tends to uh, uh, rise up and they are easy to diagnose relatively, but in, uh, supine radiographs, these can be difficult, and the sign that can help you is deep sulcus sign. So, let's, so this is the next question. So there is a stable cystic lesion. So the lesion, if you're not picked it up, is in the retrocrural, so right retrocrural space, there is a lesion. Uh, what would your, uh, what would be your next best step be? So if you have not yet uh, able to identify, just look besides the aorta, there is an oblong cystic lesion. So what would your diagnosis, uh, what would be the next best step be in this case? Would you follow up, uh, no further follow up? Do you refer for IR for biopsy or would you do a PET CT? So yeah, as you see, the questions uh, are slightly becoming tougher uh, as you move on. So make sure that you give it enough time Let's look at this image. So uh, now that my pointer is not showing up, I'll guide you through what I'm trying to show. Uh, if you look besides the aorta, there is this cystic lesion on the axial section. And superiorly, uh, uh, on the coronal scan, uh, this lesion has an oblong kind of appearance. And I mentioned that this lesion has been stable. So follow-up would be a good choice, but I've told you that it's already stable. So that would not be the best choice. So does anybody know what this structure in the retrocrural space beside the aorta is? You can let me know in the chat, uh, YouTube chat. So this uh, is a normal anatomical structure. So that's another clue for you guys. So this is uh, the cisterna chile. So cisterna chile uh, is the dilatation, like a focal dilatation of the lymphatic system, commonly seen in this region on the right side of the aorta. 
usually it's fluid uh, fluid density or low density because it contains lymph so that's obvious but sometimes it can have a slightly complex option and i've seen people following it up consider like especially in uh, cancer centers considering that uh, it's a node uh, so that's uh, important to know another important uh, normal structure in this region so if you see a soft tissue lesion adjacent uh, on the left side of the aorta at this level or slightly lower uh, the normal anatomic structure in that region is celiac axis. So celiac axis normally you don't see it, but in some patient uh, you may see the celiac ganglion. Sorry, it's called the celiac ganglion or the axis. So celiac ganglion is another common soft tissue uh, structure or lesion which I've seen people call uh, as a, a node uh, and uh, that has been followed up. So that's just some anatomy for you guys. So Ed has moved on, uh, like I think he's taken over Ayush uh, in this question. And uh, if you answer multiple questions in a row, what you get is a streak. So Darshan uh, has come back with the answer of, answer streak of three. So the competition is getting tougher. So febrile neutropenia in a post stem cell transplant patient. So what would be the least likely diagnosis? So I don't want the diagnosis or the best diagnosis in this case. I'm looking for what would be the least likely diagnosis. So for those who are new uh, to the YouTube uh, Radio Gyan channel, uh, make sure that you subscribe to the channel. Subscription is free. Uh, and if you just click on the notifications bell, uh, you'll get notified every time that I upload a new video. It becomes difficult to send in an email every time because it's a big list. Uh, there are a lot of things that I have to do along uh, with the email. So it's just not a simple email. So if you switch on notifications, you'll be notified automatically. Okay, so 39 of you have got it right, and that's the correct, uh, so they've said ischemic colitis, and that is the correct answer. Uh, I'll go over why uh, ischemic colitis would be the best diagnosis in this, uh, least likely diagnosis in this case. So graft versus host disease, uh, commonly you'll see enterocolitis, so you, like a long segment of bowel will be involved, and there'll be additional signs. Uh, the important appearance in that case is that you'll see submucosal edema, involving both the colon and uh, the small bowel. So, and at times it can also involve just the colon. So it's not necessary to involve both. So definitely graft versus host disease, uh, given the history of the patient can give rise to this appearance. Uh, there is a very nice radiographics article, which talks about the timeline of uh, imaging appearances in transplant patients. So what are the complications or imaging appearances that you have to look for, uh, say, per, say in few days, in few weeks, and a few months from uh, transplant. So make sure that you read that. Uh, that's a nice article. Uh, neutropenic colitis definitely can cause this. So this uh, was neutropenic colitis. So in immunocompromised patients, commonly uh, you'll get pan colitis, and sometimes it's restricted to the cecum. So that has a particular name. So what is colitis? Uh, neutropenic colitis restricted to a cecum known as you can let me know in the chat section so that can also give rise to this appearance and pseudomembranous colitis uh, although this is not very typical but this long uh, long segment involvement is very characteristic for pseudomembranous colitis and you get that typical accordion appearance only in the final stages so in the early stages uh, especially if the patient has been on uh, a lot of antibiotics uh, you should be thinking of pseudomembranous colitis. And the reason why this is not ischemic colitis or ischemic colitis would be least likely is because of the long segment of involvement. So remember, uh, ischemia usually uh, in most cases would affect a single artery or uh, the commonly affected areas are the watershed areas. So the watershed areas are uh, the junction of the hepatic flexure, uh, the splenic flexure with the transverse colon. So that's uh, the SMA, IMA uh, watershed area. And the other watershed is, I think, somewhere in the region of the rectosigmoid. Although I've not seen a lot of rectosigmoid ischemic colitis, but splenic flexure, the junction of the descending and transverse colon, that's a common location for ischemic colitis. 
uh, and uh, so the reason why ischemic colitis is not a diagnosis, not a favored diagnosis in this case is because uh, the involvement is long segment. If we didn't have this history, you can also put an ulcerative colitis in the differential. So long segment involvement usually can be infective or inflammatory. So keep those diagnoses higher up in your differential. Okay, so let's move on. I think this is question number 10. So straightforward question, what's your diagnosis for this one? So tephylitis is the correct answer for the previous uh, question that I asked. Uh, sequel inflammation is known as tephylitis and it's very common with neutropenic patients. So what is your best diagnosis? So I do see, so the correct answer here is GCT giant cell tumor. I do see 11 of you have picked option two. And that's the reason why I had, uh, I had put that purposefully there because uh, you need to know your full forms when you're writing, uh, writing an exam or speaking up in an exam. I know this is stupid, but uh, it's always good practice to use, uh, like not use abbreviations in your exams. So for example, this is something, a mistake that I committed in my exam. Uh, there was a case of GCT, something similar to this, that was a giant cell tumor, but uh, I, for some reason, uh, I was not able to recollect the full form and I said germ cell tumor, which was definitely a blunder. Uh, I'll, we'll go over the image here. So what we see here is an expansile lytic eccentric lesion, which reaches up to the subarticular, uh, uh, reaches almost up to the articular portion. So that is a very typical appearance for GCT, that is giant cell tumor. Aneurysmal bone cyst definitely is a differential. It can occur like a secondary uh, transformation to ABC, but in this case, uh, very few tumors uh, will reach up to the articular portion of the uh, articular portion of bone. Uh, ABC you would expect it to be more proximal. So a lytic, uh, the typical differential for, uh, typical uh, description for a giant cell tumor is an expansile, eccentric, lytic lesion, which reaches up to the articular surface. So this was a case of giant cell tumor and not germ cell tumor. Another uh, kind of twisted question. So what drug history would you ask for this patient? So we have a pelvic radiograph. For those who are finding it difficult, uh, identifying the finding, look at the left femoral metadiphyseal region. So there is a transverse lucency at the lateral as involving the lateral aspect of the left femur. What specific drug history are you looking for? So 36 of you of, of you have got it correct. Uh, which is alendronate and a few of you like almost 50 percent of you have mentioned corticosteroids and uh, I, I was expecting that and that's why i've put it so this uh, is uh, the classic appearance for bisphosphonate induced uh, fracture so if when these patients are on bisphosphonate for long periods of time i think it's more than about five years they can have these insufficiency fractures along the lateral aspect of the femur uh, and they are very characteristic for bisphosphonate related uh, stress. Uh, corticosteroids definitely can cause osteoporosis and uh, fractures, uh, but uh, they don't cause this typical appearance. Another important finding that you need to look for in uh, corticosteroids is uh, avascular necrosis. So if a patient is on long-term corticosteroids, make sure that you evaluate the femoral head properly uh, to rule out, uh, say, maybe a subtle subchondral crescent fracture. So this was a case of bisphosphonate-related febrile fracture. Another important thing to do is always and always look at the opposite femur because it's a systemic process. These fractures are usually bilateral. So make sure uh, that you uh, look at the opposite femur. And if you have just a single radiograph, you should always suggest bilateral, like a uh, to, uh, to image the other femur as well. So this was a case of bisphosphonate related, uh, so alendronate is a bisphosphonate and I purposefully put the drug name because if I'd put bisphosphonate, maybe it would have been very easy for all of you.
So I think at the end of 11 questions, uh, Anil has moved on to the lead with 9,295 points and others are also not far behind. So they are within uh, a range of 1,000 points. So the questions are slightly tougher from now on. So which of the following, okay, so this, the question is wrong. Apologies for this. This is a simple question. What's the diagnosis? Is it artery of Porcherion? Is it artery of Hubner infarct? Is it artery of Adamkevich? Or is it artery of Davidoff and Schechner infarct? Apologies for uh, the question here. So most of you have got it uh, correct. Uh, so this is a diffusion weighted images, uh, uh, diffusion weighted image. We see bilateral infarcts involving the medial portion of both thalami. Uh, so that is the typical distribution of an anatomical variant known as artery of Percherion. So this is an artery of Percherion infarct. The other arteries uh, are not made up arteries. I'll go over them. So the artery of Hubner is a branch of the anterior cerebral artery. Uh, it is important in cases of ACOM aneurysms and treatment of those. So this artery, the artery of Hubner, uh, it's also known as the recurrent artery of Hubner. So it arises from around the uh, ACOM and then uh, curls on itself to supply the medial aspect of the frontal lobe. So in cases of ACOM aneurysm clipping, this artery can be injured and that can give rise to a infarct in unilateral medial frontal lobe. So that's the artery of Hubner. Uh, the second option was artery of Adamkevich. So artery of Adamkevich is uh, a dominant thoracic, uh, a dominant spinal artery at the thoracic level. And the importance of this artery is that in cases of bronchial artery embolizations, accidentally, if there is a systemic communication, the artery of Adamkevich can be infarcted and that can give rise to a uh, spinal infarct. So that's the artery of Adamkevich. I think it's somewhere in the mid or lower thoracic region. Uh, that's that. Uh, the last option was artery of Davidoff and Schettner. Uh, this is a very rare artery. I just wanted an eponymous artery. So this is a branch of the posterior cerebral artery that supplies the parafalcine uh, region, uh, the fox basically, but uh, it's not of much clinical importance other than dural AV fistulas that can occur there. Yeah, thanks uh, Merd, M-E-R-D for pointing that out. Uh, I'm sorry for the last question. So again, I again a slightly difficult question. Uh, I'll point out the anomaly. Uh, so look just beneath the anterior abdominal wall in the uh, right half. So just at the junction of the pelvic girdle muscles and uh, anterior abdominal wall. Beneath uh, the anterior abdominal wall, there is a cystic structure. So what diagnosis? What is your diagnosis for this cystic structure uh, in this? 45 year old male patient. Apologies for the annotations not working. I did try those, but for some reason they're not showing up on uh, your screen. Maybe I will find a solution for uh, the next quiz. So is this undescended, undescended testicular tissue? Could this be a proline hernia plug? Uh, is this cystic adenoma of vas deferens or is this a necrotic node? So the correct answer here is a proline hernia plug. Uh, again, uh, uh, the reason that I showed up is uh, people have called like all of these options. Uh, people have uh, like I've had uh, studies where these have been reported for this uh, lesion. So uh, the one history which I should have given you was that this uh, lesion is stable. So apologies for that. So uh, this appearance is very typical for a hernia plug. So whenever they do uh, hernia surgeries, they put in uh, this proline plug. So probably to uh, prevent recurrence uh, of uh, the hernia. So this low density structure, which was being stable for a long time, uh, is a proline hernia plug. Undescended testis would be slightly more uh, hyper dense than this and would be more rounded. The other options here, and most of you uh, clicked cystic adenoma of vas deferens, that is uh, 
a good thought uh, and i i purposefully put that but uh, i have not seen uh, a case yet and probably that it is a fair diagnosis but uh, the answer that i was looking for is uh, proline plug i'm sorry that my pointer is not uh, seeing uh, so aftab is requesting to point it out so if you look just beneath the abdominal wall on the right side uh, there is a cystic structure that's uh, what the proline plug is okay so the next question is which of the following is not true regarding this case so you have one minute to so look at the question carefully uh, and the options carefully the questions from now on are complex so uh, remember that and try to give these enough time. So if you're in a hurry trying to get more points, you lose all your points. So make sure that you give these enough time. So the region of interest here is the ileocecal junction. So look carefully in the ileocecal junction. And then if you look at the options, uh, that will give away the diagnosis for this case. So uh, the last option people are saying in the chat, somebody is saying B. It's tough to say which is B because they, they have not labeled it A, B, C, D, but uh, we'll go over all the options. So 34 have got, your, got it right. Uh, so this was an ileo, uh, ileal, uh, ileocecal junction carcinoid. You see this arterially enhancing lesion uh, in the ileocecal junction. And the reason that I can say that it's uh, an arterially enhancing lesion, because if you see the contrast, uh, in the artery, uh, in the aorta, there is bright uh, enhancement of the uh, aorta, and uh, the veins uh, do not show much enhancement. So this is an arterial phase. You see this hyper-enhancing lesion, and there's probably a node in this region too. So this was an ileocecal junction carcinoid. Terminal ileum is the most common site uh, in the GI uh, system, so that is correct. The point that I wanted to highlight in this case uh, was that carcinoid syndrome is not uh, the most common diagnosis and the reason is uh, so what happens is that obviously a carcinoid uh, tumor is a neuroendocrine tumor so it secretes a bunch of uh, 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 inflammatory uh, uh, say uh, chemicals uh, out of that uh, tryptophan is the one which is responsible tryptophan and serotonin serotonin uh, is responsible for carcinoid syndrome in patients without metastasis uh, liver, the normal liver, uh, metabolizes the uh, serotonin, so you do not get carcinoid syndrome. So unless uh, a patient has liver mets, a carcinoid will not cause uh, carcinoid syndrome. So that was the point uh, that I wanted to highlight. So once there are mets in the liver, then they can release uh, serotonin directly into the bloodstream, and uh, then th it can cause carcinoid syndrome, but that is not very common. Uh, as in it's not very common it is common but it's not uh, super common so that was the answer that I was looking for and that was the point that I wanted to highlight so carcinoid syndrome can occur in patients with carcinoid tumors mostly when there are liver meds without liver meds it's been reported but it's rare so these are the last five questions remember that these carry double the points uh, maybe not this one so maybe for the next one this one is a routine question that cause carries normal points the question is where is the tip of the PICC catheter is it in the zygous vein is it at the cavoatrial junction is it in the lower SVC or is it in the hemiazygous vein so uh, you see this left-sided PICC catheter and it's coming down up to the level of the right main bronchus. So excellent, so 30 of you have got it right. So normally uh, the expected location for a PICC catheter or an IG line is the cavoatrial junction. So that's the uh, that is the carina, and if you look, uh, it, be, it should be somewhere close to the uh, right main bronchus level. And usually it's a straight line. If you look carefully, this patient, uh, the tip of the catheter is curved. So this catheter is not in the SVC line. You don't expect it to be curved like this. 
Uh, I have the CT image, but unfortunately there's no way to show uh, like a follow-up companion image along with this. So this tip uh, was in the azygous vein. So uh, if you see uh, anything like this, make sure that you call up your uh, physicians and let them know because uh, that is not an ideal position for APICC catheters. Okay, so these are the double point questions. Yeah, good that it showed up there. So now we know that these questions carry double the points. Look at the case carefully. What syndrome does this female patient have? And an additional history that I wanted to give you is that uh, the pleural effusion in ascites resolved once they resected this lesion. So this is a tough question. Uh, I can understand, uh, I'm expecting too much to answer uh, using a single image, but uh, these are the top five, uh, the last five questions, and I want uh, I wanted them to be difficult for everyone. But the options here uh, would give away the diagnosis, so uh, it's not that difficult either. So what we see here is a large abdominal pelvic tumor. There is some ascites, and there is a right pleural effusion. So what syndrome would you associate with ascites, pleural effusion, and a pelvic tumor that resolved after the, uh, the, the, the ascites and pleural effusion resolved after they resected the tumor? So all of you have got it right. So that's MEIG syndrome, M-E-I-G. Uh, that is a syndrome when there is ascites and pleural effusion that resolves after resection after, uh, of the ovarian tumor. So that was an important point which I was not aware of, uh, that the syndrome is typically described when the ascites and pleural effusion resolve after a section of the tumor. Okay, so close competition. Uh, we, all of you are within uh, 2,000 points of each other. So anybody can win. And remember, top three uh, contestants get the book. So it doesn't matter if you're one, number one, number two, or number three. So the question here has what has changed in between these radiographs? So between the radiograph on the left, that is the before radiograph, and the radiograph on the right is an after radiograph. So what changed in between these? Give it enough time, look at it carefully, um, and then choose your option. So as you can obviously see, the, pa the patient is presenting with obstruction in the image on the left. And then the follow-up image <clears throat> two days later is suddenly you're able to see more structures like the bowel uh, stands out really well. So what would you think of? Uh, did we increase the KV? Did we use a Bucky film? Uh, did we increase the MAS or is it none of the above? Okay, so uh, this was uh, so kind of a mixed response, uh, and I I'll go through what I was expecting in this case. So if you see, as I described, uh, the bubble uh, you see way more like more, you see better in the second image, and the reason for that is that this purple this patient has perforated, and now what you see is pneumoperitoneum giving rise to the regular sign. It's very difficult to appreciate right away. Uh, if you just get the image on the right, but now that you have a comparative image on the left, you can see how beautifully you can see uh, air on either side of the bubble loops. So this was Rigler's sign in pneumoperitoneum, and those who said none of the above, that is the correct answer that I was looking for. So I know I, can, I know it was a tough question, but uh, that's what I was looking for. Okay, last three questions. Again, for double points, where would you look next? For those who have been following uh, the Radio Gyan YouTube channel and the website, you have an edge here. Where will you look next? But again, it's not a straightforward question. It's a two-step question, and that's how these MCQs can be formed. Most of the times uh, in these MCQs, in competitive exams, you'll be able to get the correct answer and you'll be excited, oh, this is the diagnosis. But when you look at the options, they are not looking for uh, the correct diagnosis. They're looking for uh, something more. So this is what I've tried to emulate, like a two-step question. So where would you look next? Would you look at the hepatic veins? 
would you look at the contrast CT chest? Would you look at the portal venous phase in the liver? Or would you compare it to a prior imaging study? So what we see here, uh, this is difficult to uh, determine what phase this is because there's some contrast in the renal uh, system, but this probably due to injection. This, the important finding here is uh, there is intense enhancement uh, just beside the falciform ligament uh, or what is known as the quadrate lobe. And there are these small uh, subcutaneous uh, veins that are again very prominent for this phase of the study. The IVC has uh, kind of uh, also has intense contrast. So that should make you think of the hot quadrate sign in cases of SVC obstruction. So this uh, patient had a lung tumor which had obstructed the SVC and blood flow from the rest of the upper body was now draining through uh, subcutaneous veins uh, which are also known as veins of SAPI into uh, via multiple channels, one of those channels is the liver and that's why you get this intense enhancement in the arterial phase in the quadrate lobe uh, in cases of SVC obstruction. So the correct option is that we look, we would look next into the CT chest. If it was a hot caudate lobe sign, so if you see uh, intense enhancement in the caudate lobe, you have to look in the venous phase for Bud Chiari syndrome. Okay. So last two questions. What would you be most concerned about? So the question here is, what would you be most concerned about? Look at the image carefully. There are multiple findings. I want you to be, I want you to tell me what would you be most concerned about? Would you be concerned about a left femur chondrosarcoma? Would you be concerned about an acute fracture of the left pubic famous? Would you be concerned about hereditary multiple exhaustosis? Or would you be concerned about right iliac bone chondrosarcoma? So this is a pelvic radiograph frontal view. You see multiple abnormalities here. So you see these multiple osteochondromas. There is some dysplasia involving the femoral heads. Uh, like you, you don't see the normal uh, concave uh, femoral head neck junction. There's probably a osteochondroma involving the right iliac bone as well. So the correct answer, which oh, only a few of you got right, is left femur chondrosarcoma. Uh, I'll go over why I was uh, concerned about this lesion. So uh, there are multiple osteochondromas for sure. So this is a case of hereditary multiple exhaustosis. Uh, if you look at the calcification uh, involving the left femoral lesion, that is typical of chondroid calcification, uh, which is the ring and arc type of calcification. And hereditary multiple exhaustosis, these patients have multiple osteochondromas, and these are prone to malignant transformation. So uh, whenever these patients are followed up with radiographs, the reason that they are following up is to look for malignant transformation. This patient had acute uh, pain uh, in his left femur, a femur, a left thigh, not the femur, left thigh, and he was presenting uh, with uh, this malignant transformation of an left femur osteochondro uh, osteochondroma. Uh, the lesion in the right uh, iliac, uh, I do accept uh, that answer as well, but if you look at the calcification there, it's not very typical for uh, the chondroid type ring in our calcification. So although that would also be a correct answer, but the answer that I was looking for was the left uh, femoral chondrosarcoma. On MR imaging, uh, the finding that you look for is you measure the cartilage cap. The cartilage cap thickness more than two centimeter is suggestive of malignant transformation of osteochondromas. Remember uh, that there is a lot of confusion uh, in the uh, cartilage cap, but uh, there was a radiographic study, a radiology study, a uh, study in radiology that they published, and they said that when you use a cutoff for two centimeter, the sensitivity and specificity is higher. So two centimeter is the number that you have to remember. Okay, so before we move on to the last question, we have 
close competition. So the last question is for 2,000 points. Uh, so any of you can win. And in fact, there may be people uh, below down and uh, uh, who can climb up depending on this last question. Uh, before we move on to the question, I would re request everyone to uh, give me feedback. You can, if you like the video and if you like whatever we are doing, make sure that you hit the thumbs up button. And if you don't like it, hit the thumbs down button and let me know in the comments uh, what I can improve on. And if you're interested in supporting the channel and getting uh, access to exclusive resources, uh, you can join our channel membership. That's not compulsory. But if you uh, like to support what I do, make sure you check out the channel membership. Okay, so moving on to the last question of the Radio Gyan Kahoot quiz competition. For double points, what is your diagnosis in this female patient presenting with infertility? So remember, uh, in an exam, whenever <clears throat> you get multiple uh, studies, you will, uh, so there is a reason. So if you get two studies or two different studies in your uh, question, they are there for a reason. So make sure that you look at both the findings. In my exam, I forgot to look at a chest film from a patient and there, was rele there were relevant findings there and I missed out on that. So uh, for those who are using digital mode of examination, if you get two different examination, uh, the second examination is for a reason. So make sure that you look at it. So I'll go over this case. So this patient, <clears throat> you see the, the uterus is deviated towards the right. It's slightly small in size, but again, that's subjective. It's difficult to tell uh, without a comparative image. And the coron uh, scout image I'm showing to show that the left kidney is absent. So an absent left kidney a unit, uh, and a deviated uterus would make you think of. So 31 of you have got it right. So unicornuate uterus is difficult diagnosis to make uh, because often the uterus can look just like the normal uterus. But if you see a uterus that is normal, uh, that is less than, uh, it appears smaller for size, uh, is deviated towards one side uh, and is banana shaped. That's the typical appearance that has been described. That is characteristic for a unicornuate uterus. And the reason that I showed you the coronal scout is these patients with uh, congenital anomalies of the Mullerian system are associated with renal anomalies, which is highlighted in this case. So remember, uh, if you're looking at a pelvic exam, make sure you look at the coronal cuts. And if not, if you don't have coronal sequences covering the abdomen, you can always suggest a ultrasound to look for kidneys in these patients. So that was a case of unilateral kidneys, uh, unilat uh, unicornuate uterus, and uh, typically the kidneys on the opposite side would be absent. So a right unicornuate uterus with absent left kidney. That was the diagnosis I was looking for. So hopefully all of you had fun attending this quiz. I know a couple of questions could have had either options and that was not the point of this quiz. The point was to go over a few important questions and uh, uh, talk about uh, how examiners can uh, frame these MCQs in your exam. Uh, so if you thought that a particular answer was more correct than the one which I give, uh, apologies for that. Uh, you can always check, cross-check, uh, and sometimes uh, the framing of the question can also uh, give, uh, 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 can cause issues because I am thinking about that diagnosis in my mind, so I may not have framed it correctly. So uh, if there are any issues on those lines, apologies for that, but uh, that was not the point. The, the point of this whole quiz was to go over a few important uh, questions. Uh, and discuss associated pathology. So hopefully at the end of the quiz, you got to learn uh, a few new things. And now uh, let's move on uh, to our quiz winners. Okay, so let's see who's at the top of our podium. So with 15952 points, Anil is number two. Number, number three, number two is Tucker with 16,700 points. And number one is Rad Rez with 16,756 points. Dr. Nayab and Evils were not uh, uh, far behind. So uh, uh, congratulations to all three of you. I will uh, leave my email in the comment section of the YouTube video. Uh, you can uh, uh, email me your details 
and uh, I, uh, I will send you how can you get your book. So thank you all for uh, being part of this quiz and uh, do let me know your feedback in the comments and uh, what we can do better. And uh, if you have any suggested video topics, you can let me know those as well. Thank you and uh, see you guys in the